Welcome to the 11th Annual Sacred Trust Talks and Book Signing Event presented by the Gettysburg Foundation and Gettysburg National Military Park. The Gettysburg Foundation, the nonprofit partner of the National Park Service here at Gettysburg, is pleased to collaborate with Gettysburg National Military Park to invite renowned Civil War historians, authors, National Park Service rangers, licensed battlefield guides, and experts to this program each year to share their unique perspective on the Battle of Gettysburg and the American Civil War with our visitors. Our next speaker is Mr. Daniel Vermillier, who will discuss James Garfield and the Civil War, One Future President's Fight for the Union. James Garfield was one of several presidents who fought for the Union during the Civil War. While he is remembered best today for his tragically short presidency, his military career took him to the battlefields of the South and then to the halls of Congress, eventually helping him to reach the presidency. While his service in the Army transformed his life, it also helped to save the Union he would one day lead as president. Mr. Vermillier is a Civil War historian who currently works as a park ranger here at Gettysburg National Military Park. He has previously worked at Antietam National Battlefield, where he is also a licensed battlefield guide. In 2012, he was awarded the very first Joseph L. Harsh Memorial Scholar Award by the Save Historic Antietam Foundation. He is a native of Kirtland, Ohio, and he has previously done volunteer work for the James A. Garfield National Historic Site in Menor, Ohio. He is the author of The Battle of Kennesaw Mountain and the forthcoming book, James Garfield and the Civil War, One Ohioan's Fight for the Union. Please welcome my colleague and good friend, Dan Vermillier. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, everyone here. Uh, thanks to all the folks here at Gettysburg who work so hard to put these talks on every year. I'm very glad and honored to take part this year in the Sacred Trust Lectures. And as Chris noted, uh, I'm going to be speaking on the topic of my forthcoming book coming out later this year on James Garfield and the American Civil War. Certainly, there are no shortage of well-known and famous stories during the Civil War. We, of course, here are at Gettysburg. We're just past the 152nd anniversary of the battle here. On July 2nd, just a few days ago, there were hundreds of folks across the battlefield on different real-time programs and battle walks commemorating the very important events that happened here at Gettysburg 152 years ago. But it's worth noting that there was also another very significant anniversary on July 2nd, the anniversary of when James Garfield, President of the United States, was shot in a train station in Washington, D.C. Uh, it seems as though for folks who know the name James Garfield, either they know that Garfield is also a cartoon cat, or they know that, um, <laughs> that's good, it's always good when your opening joke gets a laugh, um, <laughs> or they know that Garfield was shot just a few months into his presidency. Um, he shares that rather grim distinction of, one of be, being one of the presidents who was assassinated. He shares the distinction with William Henry Harrison of serving a very short time, just a few months, or in Harrison's case, a few weeks, as President of the United States. But to look at Garfield's life, and of course the story of his assassination and death is very interesting, but to look at his life just as something that is leading up to his assassination is to miss a tremendous story. Without uh, his Civil War career, he never would have been President. It's been a long tradition in American history that the men who serve in America's wars will, in one form or another, likely go on to lead this nation as president. As you can see here on an opening slide, every single war in American history up until the last half of the 20th century had prominent leaders going on to become president of the United States from those wars. And of course, the Civil War is no different. There were several individuals who served in the Union Blue on the battlefields of the Civil War who would go on to lead the nation as president after the war. Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, James A. Garfield, Benjamin Harrison, and William McKinley. Now, I'm very proud that these men are, first and foremost, Ohioans. Uh, that's where I'm from. Uh, actually, yeah, OH. Uh, James Garfield uh, is from my backyard in Northeast Ohio. He was baptized in the Chagrin River as a boy or as a young man, that's the river that ran through my backyard when I was growing up. So I've always had a personal connection with James Garfield that drew me to his story. But his story is so remarkable and so untold, which is a rarity in the Civil War community, that we would have someone of so much prominence as to be President of the United States, yet his Civil War story would be untold. It's a fascinating story that I'd like to share with all of you here today. Of course, James Abram Garfield, the 20th President 
of the United States of America, born on another very significant date associated with the Battle of Gettysburg, or should I say the Gettysburg Address, November 19th. That's his birthday. 1831, November 19th. And Garfield would have many things in common with Abraham Lincoln. They had a rough early going of it in their early years of life. Uh, Garfield born November 19, 1831 in Orange, Ohio. His father died when he was just two. Lincoln's mother died when he was very young. His childhood was similar to Lincoln's. Uh, his family really didn't have much money. He came from poverty in many different ways. But as Garfield would say in 1857, the world talks about self-made men. Every man that is made at all is self-made. And this will certainly apply to his story. At the age of 16, he left home to try to have a, a life out on the open sea. He went to uh, the city of Cleveland to get a job on a ship, and the ship captain cursed him out so strongly, he decided he was going to go work on the canals for a few weeks. Kept falling in the water and getting sick, so he decided that wasn't for him, so he went back home. And he turned to books and learning, something else that's similar to Lincoln, finding salvation in the written word in difficult times. In the early 1850s, he studied at the Geauga Seminary, and he made his way uh, to the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute, a small school in Hiram, Ohio. He left Ohio, went to Massachusetts, studied at Williams College, and that expanded his horizons in many ways. In the early 1850s, Garfield became a baptized disciple of Christ, and this is a branch of Christianity that rejected political association, which is odd for a future president of the United States. So during the first half of the 1850s, as the issue of slavery and abolitionism is raging across the country and igniting this massive debate, Garfield is saying in his letters and his private diaries, hey, I want nothing to do with this. But when he leaves Ohio for Massachusetts, he begins to hear some different things. He listens to some speeches from some transcendentalists. He expands his horizons. And when he returns, returns to Ohio in the later 1850s, He's now a teacher at the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute. He becomes the president of the school, and he becomes very much engaged in politics of the day, which is very much related to his Civil War story. By 1859, he was elected to the Ohio State Senate as a Republican. He was elected in October of 1859. Anybody think of anything significant that may have been going on the month of October 1859? The John Brown Raid. And guess where John Brown originated from? Garfield's Senate District in Ohio. Garfield sympathized very much with John Brown. On December 2nd of 1859, the day that Brown was executed, Garfield wrote very uh, passionately in his diary, in his journal, about the death of this man and the cause that he fought for. He said, a dark day for our country. I have no language to express the, confl the conflict of emotion in my heart. I do not justify his acts by no means. But I do accord to him, and I think every man must, honesty of purpose and sincerity of heart. Garfield noted that the admirable characteristics which Brown possessed were many. He said, when I remember all this, it seems as though God's warning angel should sound the words of a patriot of other and better days. The words, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, and his justice will not always slumber. Of course, that's another very famous quote from a famous American. Brave man, old hero, farewell. Your death shall be the dawn of a better day. And he also wrote a separate entry as well that was much shorter, and it was in Latin. He wrote, Servidium esto demnatum. And I'm no classical linguist or scholar of Latin, but I believe that translates as slavery be damned. So he had gone in just a few years from rejecting association with abolitionists to writing passionately about the death and execution of John Brown in his diary. It is setting him up for his rise in politics. As an Ohio State Senator, Garfield is entering the Ohio State House in January of 1860. So he's entering politics right before the Civil War begins. And the State House itself had just been finished at that time. And he's going to rise quite, quick, quite quickly in Republican state politics. He's going to become close friends with another future Civil War figure, Jacob Cox. He and Cox were known as two radical Republicans in the State Senate. And Garfield spoke passionately on a number of issues. And with the growing uh, belief that perhaps war was around the corner with these sectional pensions that had risen so greatly, Garfield spoke passionately, unappropriately enough, July 4th of 1860 in Ravenna, Ohio, saying, there's not going to be a civil war. What are you talking about? 
says, when I look at a map of our country, when I see the beautiful unity of its physical structure, the exhaustless variety of its natural resources, I cannot but believe that in the deep counsels of God, when he lifted the continents from the sea, shaped their outline, and divided their surface by natural boundaries, it was decreed that here should dwell forever a mighty nation, free, glorious, undivided. Who can divide the mighty Mississippi and bid its waters flow back to their mountain springs, or who roll back the resistless tide of commerce that sweeps down his valley? He's essentially saying that the United States has as great a chance of breaking apart as you do of stopping the Mississippi River. This is July 4th, 1860. And it sets a benchmark that we're going to come back to at the end of our program, because he gives another speech on July 4th of uh, 1865, and it's going to be much different in many ways. But it shows that on the eve of the war, even as a, a relatively young and uh, ambitious state senator in Ohio, Garfield was still unprepared for the task ahead. This is not a man that you would necessarily think of in rising in national politics. But the coming years would transform his, his life as well as the life of the nation. He spoke passionately that summer in favor of Abraham Lincoln. He campaigned on Lincoln's behalf in the state of Ohio. And when Lincoln was elected and, making, and was making his way to Washington in February of 1861, Lincoln delivered a speech at the Ohio State House. Garfield was there. And that evening, he met President Lincoln at a reception at the home of Ohio Governor William Dennison, one future president meeting a president-elect. 20 years would separate their presidencies. But of course, Lincoln's election brings about this larger conflict of secession. And secession will jar Garfield awake, much as it would the rest of the nation at that time. On, in January of 1861, just months after he had said, what are you talking about? We're not going to break apart. We're a great country. In January of 1861, he was writing letters back and forth with another future Civil War officer, William B. Hazen, who was also from Ohio and a close friend of Garfield's. And he wrote to Hazen, I am inclined to believe that the sin of slavery is one which it may be said that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. All that is left for us as a state or as a company of northern states is to aim and prepare to defend ourselves and the federal government. I believe the doom of slavery is drawing near. Let war come and let the slaves will get a vague notion that it is waged for them and a magazine will be lighted whose explosion must shake the whole fabric of society. Well, of course, that explosion would come. In April of 1861, shots are fired against Fort Sumter and war begins. Garfield, of course, is tremendously and deeply affected by this, by the onset of war. In the months leading up to this, he and Jacob Cox could be seen on the State House grounds drilling and practicing military maneuvers while others were trying to prevent the onset of war. In April of 1861, think about the mindset of the United States at that time. Think about the mindset of three-month volunteers. Think about the mindset that this war is going to be over quickly without much bloodshed. On April 14th of 1861, this is what Garfield wrote in a letter to a close friend of his, the day that Fort Sumter is fallen. I am glad we are defeated at Sumter. It will rouse the people. I can see no possible end to the war until the South is subjugated. I hope we will never stop short of complete subjugation. Better lose a million men in battle than allow the government to be overthrown. The war will soon assume the shape of slavery and freedom. The world will so understand it and I believe the final outcome will redound to the good of humanity. He writes that when the war is two days old. Think of a list of other people who are saying that same thing in April of 1861, and it will be an incredibly short list. He is saying in April of 61, two days after the first shots are fired, that he would rather see a million men die in battle than the nation be overthrown. And it, didn't, it did not reach quite a million deaths during the war, but there were far more than a million casualties during the conflict. And of course, Garfield was correct. This war would assume the shape of slavery and freedom, and the world, including us 152 years later, would rightfully so understand it. Well, of course, Garfield is affected by the war fever which is gripping the nation at that time. And many, especially young, eager politicians, are rushing to serve their country. And some are not having any difficulty at all in getting involved in this war. One of them, Rutherford Hayes, 
who was appointed as a uh, major in the 23rd Ohio Infantry, a regiment which had two future presidents in it, Rutherford Hayes and William McKinley. Garfield did not have very much luck in 1861. He had kind of a rough go of it. He's uh, still trying to help out the governor, William Dennison, pictured here with raising troops and recruiting men. He goes to Illinois trying to get some muskets for the Union cause. He's doing everything that he can, and he, he misses out narrowly on getting appointed to a couple different Ohio regiments. And this really bothered him, so much so that by the summer of 61, he actually turned down an appointment to the 24th Ohio. Well, by July, August of 61, he realized that, yeah, I do need to get out there. I, I can't let my depression overwhelm me. And he accepts an appointment with the 42nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry. This is a regiment which would be forever associated with James Garfield and his Civil War career. Pictured here are two officers in the 42nd Ohio whose names probably aren't very well known to many of you, Lionel Sheldon and Don Pardee. They are two prominent officers in the 42nd who would go on to lead the regiment in their own right once Garfield had risen to bigger and greater things during the war. But they, all, they had their own prosperous post-war careers as well. Lionel Sheldon would become an attorney in New Orleans after the war, and he became a Republican in Congress with Garfield. He became the governor of the New Mexico Territory after the war. And Don Pardee was an attorney as well. He was one of Garfield's appointees to the federal courts in 1881, and he served in the courts for 38 years. Garfield is out there in the state of Ohio recruiting this regiment. In his earlier years, he had been an itinerant preacher and minister, and he was known to preach two or three times on the same Sunday, giving these rousing sermons. And during these sermons, he would ask people to stand for Christ. Well, now as he's recruiting men for this regiment, when he gives these passionate speeches about the Union and the war, at the end, he's asking people to stand for the Union. And it's a highly effective recruiting tool. He raises this regiment, the 42nd Ohio. And by November of 1861, he is drilling the men. And remember, he also has a background as a teacher and the administrator and a a president of a school, a college. So he's using that to teach his men the ways of being a soldier. He's even taking wooden blocks and he's using them to represent tactics on the battlefield. It's kind of like our battlefield in the box program, right, Chris? <laughs> so he's doing a lot to teach the officers under his command and to train the soldiers under his command how to effectively fight in a war. And this is a guy who has no military service whatsoever, but he is very good at teaching others how to do things. Garfield wrote on the aspect of preparing for war. It is remarkable with what facility the American mind adapts itself to situations. That's certainly a quote that is applicable to many different eras and generations of American history. Well, by November of 1861, his regiment is recruited. By December of 1861, they are off to war. They're sent off to war, first to the state of Kentucky. Now. By a show of hands, how many folks have ever heard of the big Sandy Valley campaign? <laughs> Not many. Not many at all. Uh, it is one of the most unknown about campaigns during the course of the Civil War. But this is where James Garfield first makes his mark upon the military map of the war. In December of 1861, in the far eastern reaches of Kentucky, where the state is connecting with Virginia. A Confederate named Humphrey Marshall has brought a brigade of soldiers and is occupying the far eastern reaches of the state. Garfield is called to Louisville, where he meets Don Carlos Buell. Buell tells Garfield, guess what? You get to design a campaign and take a brigade of completely untested soldiers into this remote wilderness region without any decent roads and try to push him out, push out Humphrey Marshall. So Garfield designs a campaign that is going to be taking place in the Big Sandy Valley, the map of which you can see on the screen. It's going to be a very difficult task, but he's going to rise to the challenge. Now the guy he is going to be fighting against, Humphrey Marshall, he is a portly fellow. He has greatly more experience than Garfield does. Uh, this is a guy who served several terms in Congress before the war. He is a West Point graduate. He was the United States Minister to China for a brief time during the 1850s. This is a guy who certainly is acquainted with being a military officer and with leading men in battle. And he's going up against a 29-year-old state senator from Northeast Ohio with a brigade of untested soldiers from Ohio and Kentucky. As proof of Marshall's experience, 
This is a image of him fighting at the Battle of Buena Vista in 1847. Garfield was 16 years old at that time, uh, drowning in the canals of Ohio. So you're going to stack these guys up on paper. I know which guy I'd put my money on here in this campaign. But history doesn't really work like that. You don't really pick winners and losers according to resumes in history. That's one of the remarkable things about it. Garfield takes a brigade of untested soldiers, again, Ohioans and Kentuckians. There are problems with weather. Some nights during this campaign, it's snowing three to six inches on the ground. These guys out on picket duty are freezing. The roads are absolutely horrible. Uh, the heavy snow and rains are washing away whatever decent roads there are. He's got inexperienced men. Some of them do not have serviceable muskets. Some of them are so ravaged by disease that the regiments aren't really able to be used. And of course, he is an inexperienced commander. But nonetheless, in December and January of 1861 and 1862, he is pushing Humphrey Marshall and his men back through the Big Sandy Valley. And by January 10th of 1862, Garfield will square off in a battle with Marshall's command the Battle of Middle Creek. Again, anybody ever heard of this before? All right. But even when folks at Gettysburg have never heard of it, you know it's obscure. I mean, we got the Battle of Middle Creek, January 10th of 1862. It is an extremely small battle, less than 100 casualties. Marshall's men had taken position on ridge lines around Middle Creek, running through the remote wilderness regions of eastern Kentucky. Garfield's men charge up the slopes and drive him back. During the course of the battle, Garfield would write very passionately about it. He would take some liberties with his descriptions of the battle, as did a lot of officers and soldiers during the war. But it is clear that in this battle, Garfield is able to, without any artillery, with inexperienced men, drive Confederates off of a good defensive position in very cold weather. That night, as the Confederates retreated, they could see the burning light of the Confederate ammunition in stores, what they didn't want to fall into federal hands on the other side of the ridge lines, and it was gr a great success for Garfield. So much so that this is what really launches his national profile in many different ways. It launches him from an Ohio figure to a national figure. The Ohio State Legislature is passing resolutions thanking him for his actions at Middle Creek. The new governor of the state, David Todd, pictured here, writes Garfield a letter praising him for his actions in defending the state of Kentucky. And the state of Kentucky itself issues a resolution thanking James Garfield. Now take a step back and think about the big picture here at this point in time. Think about the big picture going on at this point in the war. January of 62, George Thomas and Mill Springs. February of 62, Ulysses Grant, Henry and Donaldson in Tennessee. There is a large tide of federal momentum sweeping through the state of Kentucky into the state of Tennessee. Today, when we think about these Union successes in early 62, we think mostly just of Thomas and Grant. And certainly, I'm not saying that Middle Creek is on the same scale as that in terms of the size or its importance, but it's in the same breath, at least, the same sentence. And don't take my word for it. Take the word of the Kentucky State Legislature. Because when they passed a resolution thanking the Union Army for its actions in pushing Confederates out of the state, Guess which two officers Garfield's name was placed in between. They thanked George H. Thomas, Colonel James A. Garfield, and General U.S. Grant. So Garfield is rising to national prominence. As evidence, this is what leads to his promotion to the rank of general. General is the title that for the rest of his life he would be associated with. Of course, he's the President of the United States. But even many artistic depictions of his assassination and death caption them as General James A. Garfield, President of the United States. He is promoted to general because of his actions at Middle Creek in January of 1862. Sam and Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury for President Lincoln, intervenes and lobbies on his behalf, on Garfield's behalf, to see to his promotion. The Ohio State Senate and State Legislature are passing resolutions and sending them to the President, asking that Garfield be promoted as well. So Middle Creek launches his national profile in many different ways. And he is promoted to Brigadier General, with the date of rank being January 10th of 1862. In February and March of that year, he and his command are still in the Big Sandy Valley. They're dealing with some skirmishes here and there, with driving out insurgents, with some heavy weather and floods, and sickness and disease as well. 
and this disease is plaguing Garfield and his men. In February of 1862, he wrote a letter to his wife, Lucretia, of the death of a young soldier who he had recruited, a soldier who had died of disease. And it's a very poignant and emotional letter. He wrote, I declare to you, there are fathers and mothers in Ohio that I hardly know how I can ever endure to meet. A noble young man from Medina County died just a few days ago. I enlisted him, but not until I had spent two hours in answering the objections of his father who urged that he was too young to stand the exposure. He was the only child. I cannot feel myself to blame in the matter, but I assure you, I would rather fight a battle than to meet his father. So he's having professional successes, but the personal, personal hardships of this war are wearing on him, even at this early stage. Well, as I noted in January and February of 1862, there is a large tide of momentum sweeping south into the Western Confederacy. And by March, Confederate forces in the West were gathering in Corinth, Mississippi, under the command of Albert Sidney Johnston, preparing to make a determined strike against this federal advance. And this strike was meant to guard the crucial rail junction of Corinth. Well, just as there was this tide of federal momentum in a very large scale, sweeping south into the Confederacy, this tide would sweep along James Garfield with it. When he was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General, that meant he would be getting a new command. In March of 1862, he was called away from the 42nd Ohio and the 18th Brigade, which he had been leading in the Big Sandy Valley, and he was given command of a new brigade, the 20th Brigade in the 6th Division of the Army of the Ohio. This division was commanded by an officer named Thomas Wood. We will talk about him more later. This was not the last time that Garfield's path would cross with that of Wood. But in late March and early April, Garfield and the Army of the Ohio were rushing southward into southwestern Tennessee to try to reinforce the advance of Ulysses S. Grant headed towards Corinth. And of course, on April 6th of 1862, we all know what battle began that date the Battle of Shiloh. Garfield was not there yet. He and the rest of the Army of the Ohio were still rushing to the scene. But on April 6th at dawn, Confederates are pushing back Union forces. By the end of the day, they have driven Federals back all the way to Pittsburgh Landing with thousands of casualties on each side. This was a day of warfare, the likes of which the nation had never truly seen. As Garfield and the Army of the Ohio arrive, they are strengthening Grant's lines. They are helping on April 7, 1862, a Monday, to push the Confederates back and to drive them from the field. Garfield's brigade arrived upriver, or downriver, excuse me, north of the battlefield at Savannah, Tennessee on the morning of the 7th. They were shipped by steamboat to the battlefield. They arrived there about midday. By the time they get to the front line, it's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and the Confederates are falling back. So they are not heavily engaged at Shiloh. They were there for the last shots of the battle. But as Garfield and his men arrive, they are seeing a battlefield torn apart by war, a battlefield that has suffered great scars and great loss. And on April 9th, he wrote a letter home, again to his wife, describing what he had seen arriving there at the tail end of the Battle of Shiloh. On the whole, this is no doubt the bloodiest battle ever fought on the continent, in which has been mingled our, on our side both the worst and the best of generalship, and the most noble bravery, and the most contemptible cowardice. Inch by inch, the enemy were driven back over the ground they had captured, and as night closed in, our line of battle, five miles in length, had swept the enemy back over a space of six miles. Such a scene as this 30 square miles presents beggars all attempt at description. If I live to meet you again, I will attempt to tell something of its horrors. God has been good to me, and yet I am spared. So Garfield misses out on heavy action at Shiloh, but he sees for the first time what these major battles do to battle lines and what they do to individuals, what they do to landscapes. In May of 1862, he and his brigade are a part of the Corinth campaign when Henry Halleck is trying through siege tactics to finish off Beauregard's army. But Halleck is too cautious for Garfield's taste, indeed for the taste of many and Beauregard and his army are able to slip away from Corinth without being destroyed. This, in turn, would have a major effect on Garfield as well. 
It would lead to a summer in 1862 where he grew greatly depressed once again. This time it was not depression over not having an important command, it was depression over the frustration he felt at the West Point officers around him. This speaks to a larger trend during the Civil War, uh, conflict and tension between West Point educated officers and volunteers, civilian officers. Garfield, remember his letter in April of 61, from the get-go, he wants this war to be all out, subjugating the South. He doesn't care how many casualties he takes, he wants the South destroyed. Well, now in Corinth, they let a Confederate army slip away. That summer, he's involved guarding railroads or working on railroads in Alabama. It's not really all that exciting. What's happening that summer in Virginia? McClellan is slowed down to a halt outside of Richmond. So he's growing very frustrated that summer. And his letters bear this out. They're absolutely remarkable. In case you couldn't tell, Garfield's letters that I've been reading parts of are absolutely incredible. There's a published volume of them, The Wildlife of the Army, that was published in the 1960s. It's outstanding. He writes in one of these letters, there seems to be neither generalship nor patriotism at the head of the armies. It's a remarkable quote. And in the summer of 1862, on top of all this, he is afflicted by severe illness, by dysentery. He loses 40 pounds that summer. His skin is yellow and jaundiced. And he's ultimately sent home. But before he is, he writes a remarkable letter about the state of the nation at that time. I look upon the present not only as the gloomiest hour of this war, but more gloomy than Washington's winter at Valley Forge. For Garfield personally and for the nation, the summer of 1862 was a gloomy time. But in August of 62, Garfield is sent home. He spends that month at home with his wife, Lucretia, pictured here, and their young child, Eliza, nicknamed Trot. And it's a rejuvenation for him. He had never felt very close to his wife before this time, but being home with her, spending some time with her and his child, they go to a cabin, just the three of them. He is able to recover physically, emotionally, spiritually. It builds him back up to the state that he is ready for the war once again. Also, when he is home, because of his actions in the Army, local citizens in Ohio will nominate him to run for the United States House of Representatives, the 19th District. Garfield is nominated. He is elected in October. And he promises that he will serve if elected, but he wants to stay in the Army as long as he can before resigning to take his congressional seat. In September of 1862, while he is still simply a candidate, a nominate candidate for Congress, he goes to Washington after his sick leave to await for a new command. And he arrives in Washington on September 19th of 1862. That's not a momentous week or anything, right? Two days before was the Battle of Antietam. Three days later, Lincoln issues the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, which Garfield was very much in favor of. He writes, it gives us light in the midst of the darkness and shows us the beginning of the end. Well, while Garfield is in Washington, awaiting this new command with great anxiety, he's going to learn that his next battle will not be won on the battlefield. It's going to be won within the confines of the Capitol. Remember, this is an officer who is known to dislike West Pointers. He writes in October of 1862, if the Republic goes down in blood and ruin, let its obituary be written thus, died of West Point. <laughs> this is well known to the Lincoln administration. Garfield is living with Sam and Chase when he's in Washington in the latter months of 1862. Chase is a mentor for Garfield. This will figure prominently here in just a few moments. Because of these feelings, because of these attitudes, when it is time for the court-martial of close confidant of George McClellan, Fitz John Porter, Guess who's on the court-martial? James Garfield, as well as many others who do not like West Point officers and who are in favor of a strong and vigorous persecution of the war. Garfield believed that the conviction of Fitz John Porter for failing to obey orders and failing to do his duty at Second Manassas, charges brought about by John Pope, largely to cover Pope's own tracks at Second Manassas, but he believes that Porter is indeed guilty, and he believes this quite strongly. For several weeks, at the end of 1862, he and the court-martial hear testimony from Porter. Among those testifying against Porter is Irvin McDowell. McDowell was trying to put as much of the blame on Porter as he could because McDowell had his own.